Okay, guys, let's do it. I'm sorry, I'm just uh, getting started a little bit late. Had to get some last minute data. Um, I've got uh, a few announcements. Um, our faculty uh, continue to distinguish themselves. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, Dr. Jeff Callen um, has received a, a lifetime award for his educational efforts um, by the Dermatology Foundation. Um, and I think that any of us have heard his lectures, like this comes as no gigantic surprise at all. Um, <laughs> two women in our division, in our division, in our department, have been uh, nominated to be um, most admired women in uh, medicine by today's woman, the 17th, I guess it's the 17th year of it. Um, and those are Bridget Hittipole and Christian Furman. Strong work, women. Today is National Hospitalist Day. And uh, so a few comments about our own group of hardy hospitalists that work at UofL Hospital. Um, they have seen uh, more than 23,000 uh, patient visits. Uh, they are responsible for sharing in the care of over 1,200 surgical cases. Uh, they carry a census every day um, amongst them of uh, 75, a very substantial portion of uh, the entire bed count um, of the hospital. Um, they are also, 80% of them, you know, have gotten extra certification uh, to be able to care for individuals who have opioid addiction. And last but not least, you know, very important is that it is our hospitalists who are responsible for developing the skills of H and P and patient presentation, you know, for our third year medical students. Not a small feat, I think, as all of us know, who have, you know, uh, participated in that effort. So congratulations, all the hospitalists. Thank you guys for everything that you do. And my last announcement. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Last announcement, I know everybody's been waiting for this. This is the first Grand Rounds in March. So we're gonna announce the, uh, the people who attended most Grand Rounds uh, last month. And these include Drs. Arnold, Ragaram, Mandrola, Talapanini, and Guardiola. As you can see, a few repeaters in there. But thank you guys for uh, your support of the Department of Medicine and our Grand Rounds efforts. And with that, now I'll shut up and ask Dr. Saad to come up and introduce our guest speaker. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Nishan Gupta from University of Cincinnati. Uh, we started the effort to uh, collaborating with our uh, neighbors, UK and Cincinnati, to have some of their uh, rising star scientists, uh, clinicians to come and participate in Grand Round. And, some of our own faculty go there and do that. So it's really uh, been successful. Uh, Dr. Gupta uh, got his MD degree from India. He did his residency at the University of Tennessee and his fellowship at the University of Cincinnati. And he did uh, what, you know, a fellowship in uh, rare lung disease and also University of Cincinnati. And has really a stellar uh, early career as a, t a scientist and uh, um, in a specialized area, which is interstitial lung disease. Um, he received numerous awards um, early on, uh, distinguished speaker, uh, and also a pilot grant from Dime Foundation. Had numerous publications, at least 37 uh, publications and uh, four book chapters. He has also NIH grant uh, for treatment of LAM. Um, he's going to talk to us today about the pneumothoraces and the uh, usual and unusual presentation of that. Uh, but we are very pleased to have him. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Sorry, usual technology issues. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by first thanking uh, Dr. Saad and uh, everyone here for the invitation. Uh, it's really uh, been a pleasure. Uh, have a fair bit of material to cover, but uh, feel free to uh, stop by in between if there is any question or anything that I can uh, answer or clarify. Uh, 
uh, these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, don't think any of them are re relevant for the content of the talk. Um, and I saw a paper where everyone has these learning objectives with them, so I won't uh, really belabor them. Uh, so uh, let's start with pneumothorax. So just very simply, what is a pneumothorax? A pneumothorax is essentially air in the plural cavity. And this is a very simplistic scheme. So pneumothorax can either occur from trauma, uh, which is direct trauma, as in someone got a stab wound, someone got in a car accident, or iatrogenic, which is mostly us doing a bronchoscopy or central lines, uh, or it can be spontaneous, in which it is either primary spontaneous or a secondary spontaneous. By primary spontaneous, we mean that there is no underlying lung disease that predisposed to the pneumothorax. And by secondary, we mean that there is some underlying lung disease that led to the development of the pneumothorax. Uh, now, just a very brief uh, pathophysiology of pneumothorax. So, as most of you know, that the pleural pressure is negative, uh, both compared to the atmospheric pressure as well as as compared to the alveolar pressure. So, if there is a connection that gets formed between the atmosphere and the pleural cavity uh, by trauma, whether direct trauma or hydrogenic trauma, because of the negative pleural pressure, air will move in from outside until the pressures on both sides equalize. And this is really how a pneumothorax forms. And the same phenomena happens if there is um, a rupture in the alveolar areas because of a cyst rupture or bleb rupture. And again, this pressure is negative, so air leaks until the pressure on both sides is equal. Um, and then there is a special circumstance where you can have a tension pneumothorax, which is which develops when the pleural pressure exceeds the atmospheric pressure. The most common situations where you see this is uh, in someone undergoing a positive pressure mechanical ventilation or during CPR. Uh, Tension pneumothorax in a spontaneously breathing person is uh, relatively rare, uh, but signifies that you have a one-way valve mechanism, which is that more air is entering the pleural space during inspiration than can exit during expiration. Uh, and this is just a simple uh, pathophysiology of tension pneumothorax, where you have uh, increasing intrapleural pressure that impedes uh, return from the uh, big veins, leading to decreased cardiac output and the development of shock. Uh, so primary spontaneous pneumothorax, as we uh, said earlier, it's um, in patients who have no underlying lung disease. Uh, it's a relatively common condition. So this was uh, an epidemiological study done in the UK, now about, well, uh, real UK, uh, done about uh, almost two decades ago. Uh, where the uh, prevalence of pneumothorax was 24 uh, per 100,000 uh, in men and about 10 per 100,000 uh, women. And about 50% of these pneumothoraces were uh, primary spontaneous pneumothoraces. And if you extrapolate that data, greater than 20,000 cases of primary spontaneous pneumothorax occur in the US every year. Uh, now this is uh, work done by uh, Ashley Catron, she's one of the uh, residents at the University of Cincinnati, where we uh, retrieved records from the national inpatient sample as well as the national emergency database. Um, and what we found that in, in the calendar year 2015, pneumothorax was a discharge diagnosis in over 250,000 cases. If you exclude trauma and nitrogenic causes, uh, these were the number of pneumothoraces, and if you extra, uh, calculate the prevalence from that, uh, it's about four to five times higher than the prevalence that was estimated by the UK study. So this is a, a relatively common condition that an internal medicine audience is going to encounter in their practice. So what about the etiopathogenesis? So uh, blebs and smoking are believed to play a key role in the development of primary spontaneous pneumothorax. Uh, in as many as three-fourths of the primary spontaneous pneumothorax patients, they were believed to have, they were found to have apical blebs. Uh, and there is a very strong association with a history of smoking, where 90% of these patients are either current or ex-smokers. <clears throat> More on smoking, so this is a 
old paper, a somewhat arbitrary classification of uh, the number of cigarettes per day, but you can clearly see that in both men and women, there is a very clear dose response relationship. The more you smoke, the higher the risk of developing the pneumothorax. Uh, this is also a belief which is held for a long time is that primary spontaneous pneumothorax is commonly seen in thin, tall male individuals. And it's believed that the pleural pressure gradient has something to do with it. Uh, so pleural pressure falls by about 0.2 centimeters of water per centimeter of vertical height. So in tall individuals, you have a higher mean distending pressure at the apex as compared to short individuals. Uh, but even in the 1970s, it was believed that these subpleural blebs form in genetically predisposed people, which this is really the key here, that there is a genetic predisposition in individuals to develop these blebs. Uh, and I'll be talking a lot about the genetic uh, causes in the later half of this disease. Um, so common clinical manifestations of pneumothorax, most commonly this occurs in the third decade. Um, contrary to what you might think about associations with uh, heavy activity, heavy lifting, exercise, most cases of pneumothorax happen when a patient is just sitting at rest. Um, and we have a number of patients when we deal with these, uh, they become so attuned to it that it's not unusual for us to hear from a patient, I was reading this book at 8.30 p.m. last night and that's when this pneumothorax happened. Um, the symptoms, the cardinal symptoms are acute onset, localized chest pain and dyspnea. Uh, and the chest pain is typically pleuritic in nature. Uh, physical examination, vital signs are usually normal or the patient may be mildly tachycardic. Uh, if they have tension pneumothorax, then you can have tachycardia, hypotension, uh, a really full-blown shock physiology. Um, other physical exam signs, you will have hyperresonant percussion, reduced breath sounds on the side of the pneumothorax, and you can see mediastinal shift uh, especially in cases of tension pneumothorax. So how do you diagnose a pneumothorax? Most commonly the diagnosis is established by a chest x-ray and a chest x-ray is sufficient for this diagnosis in the vast majority of the patients. Uh, ultrasound is an up and coming modality which has, which is more sensitive than chest x-ray for the diagnosis, uh, although the specificity for both uh, techniques is relatively similar. And CAT scan of the chest is considered the gold standard. Uh, so this is a chest x-ray showing uh, left-sided pneumothorax, and this is the collapsed lung with the pleural line. Um, this is an ultrasound image um, provided by one of our ultrasound experts at uh, UC. So this is the M-mode ultrasound in a normal patient showing what's known as the seashore sign. But if you have a pneumothorax, you develop uh, this sort of a barcode sign. And as I said, this is very sensitive to detect pneumothorax. Um, and this is uh, one of my clinic patients in the hospital about two weeks ago with a uh, relatively large uh, pneumothorax, as you can see on a CAT scan. Uh, so time for the clickers. So uh, we have a 32-year-old healthy non-smoking female who presents with sudden onset right-sided pleuritic chest pain and dyspnea while she was sitting at home watching TV. Um, on examination, she is in mild distress. Her heart rate is 115. She's tachypnic. Her oxygen saturation is 94% on room air. And she has decreased breath sounds uh, on the right side. You obtain a chest x-ray and you can see here that there is a moderate sized right pneumothorax. This is the pleural line. And the question is, what is the next best step in management? Uh, observation with supplemental oxygen, insert a small bore chest tube, needle aspiration, insert a large bore chest tube, or perform a CAT scan. I think we have a fair bit of responses. Uh, 
right? Looks like the majority of you got it right. Um, so the goals of treatment of primary spontaneous pneumothorax are the removal of air and prevention of recurrence. And these are two separate things. The most conservative approach to this treatment is observation, uh, typically with supplemental oxygen. And once the communication between the alveoli and pleural space is sealed, uh, the, whatever residual air is there is going to get reabsorbed spontaneously, whether you insert a tube or don't insert a tube. Um, it's just that the tube will hasten this rate of reabsorption, and without a tube, this reabsorption occurs very slowly. Um, uh, according to some old data, at the rate of about one to one and a half percent of the hemithorax gets reabsorbed over 24 hours. Uh, and this reabsorption occurs through the visceral and pleural uh, parietal capillaries. And the movement of this gas is directly proportional to the uh, pressure gradient. Uh, and that's where the role of supplemental oxygen comes in. Uh, this is uh, another old study where uh, 12 patients with primary spontaneous pneumothorax were observed on room air. And another 10 patients were alternatively given air and supplemental oxygen. Um, and as you can see that on the times when they got oxygen, the rate of reabsorption of pneumothorax was higher than the times that they got air. And this rate of reabsorption was highest in patients who had large size pneumothoraces as compared to small size pneumothoraces. So this is really the rationale for why in a pneumothorax we, are, uh, we often give supplemental oxygen. Um, why did I say a chest tube was the right answer on the previous patient was uh, purely because of the size of the pneumothorax and the fact that the patient was in some sort of a distress because she was tachycardic and tachypneic. Um, as far as draining the air is concerned, you could drain it one of two ways. You could just do a simple needle aspiration or you could insert a small bore chest tube. Uh, British Thoracic Society guidelines recommend simple aspiration as the first step. Uh, but uh, the provider uh, preference and experience uh, in the United States is more with small bore chest tubes. So overall, uh, more patients tend to get chest tubes over here than simple aspirations. Um, as far as outcomes between the two techniques are concerned, they are uh, relatively similar. Uh, this is a, a Cochrane meta-analysis comparing tube thoracostomy uh, to uh, simple uh, aspiration. And as you can see that there is uh, relatively similar outcomes with uh, a chest tube offering better immediate success. Um, on the contrary, if you have a chest tube put in rather than simple aspiration, you tend to stay in the hospital a little bit longer, which is somewhat obvious. Um, and with regards to the size of the chest tube, small bore chest tube is has equal efficacy as compared to a large bore chest tube. So for a simple pneumothorax management, there is really no need to um, subject patients to the pain and discomfort of a large bore chest tube. Um, and this question comes up sometimes, but uh, the British Thoracic Society guidelines recommend against routine use of suction because of a small increased risk of re-expansion pulmonary edema. Um, tension pneumothorax, as we talked about, it's a sudden deterioration in cardiopulmonary status due to impaired venous return. Um, happens very rarely in primary spontaneous pneumothoraces, uh, but if it happens, it is a medical emergency and uh, you need to give high flow oxygen and do immediate needle decompression. Uh, time for the next question. So in this patient, a small bore chest tube was placed. A few hours later, the air leak uh, had resolved. Uh, you wait a day, the next morning, uh, chest x-ray reveals complete resolution of the pneumothorax. Uh, the patient is anxious to go home. And at this time, what should you do? A, remove the chest tube and send the patient home. B, remove chest tube and get a CT scan before discharge. C, perform a chemical pyrodesis via the chest tube. Uh, or D, uh, perform VATS. Uh, Okay, so 50-50 split. Uh, 
uh, I actually uh, like the uh, wrong answer here a lot better than the right answer, and I will explain that a little later. Uh, but for now, the, let's say that the right answer is A. Uh, so in a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, the risk of recurrence is somewhere about uh, 30%. Um, but the range varies in the literature from 20 to 50 percent. Uh, the current guidelines, both the uh, American guidelines and the British guidelines, recommend that pleurodesis be performed after the second episode of primary spontaneous pneumothorax. Uh, the pleurodesis can be done by one of two ways. One is chemical pleurodesis, where you um, instill a sclerosing agent like talc or doxycycline directly through the chest tube, uh, or you could do it surgically, where uh, with a uh, VATS procedure where you can do pleural abrasion with or without blood slaving. Um, the recurrence rate is reduced by both approaches, but uh, the results are better with VATS as compared to chemical pleurodesis. Um, quick word on secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. As we mentioned earlier, this is pneumothorax that happens in patients with an underlying lung disease. Um, Numbers-wise, perhaps the most common cause of uh, secondary pneumothorax will be COPD. Um, and these are patients be who, because of an underlying lung disease, have high rates of recurrence and have limited pulmonary reserve. Uh, so these patients, you, uh, uh, the recommendation is to consider early pleurodesis, typically even after their first episode, and not wait for a recurrence. So uh, this patient has a lot of questions. So the patient now tells you that she was here just visiting her family and she now needs to fly back to her hometown. And she asks you, is it safe for her to fly on an airplane? So what will you tell her? It is safe for her to fly right away. She should wait for one week before she flies. She should wait for four to six weeks before she flies or she should not fly again at all. Okay, nice, a wide split. Uh, so the current answer for this is wait for one week before undertaking air travel. Uh, so why, why is air travel a concern? So this is an image taken of a, a dinner roll um, on a flight. And uh, as, so the Boyle's law states that as atmospheric pressure decreases, gas within an enclosed space will expand. So the risk with a pneumothorax is that as you enter a low pressure area of a airplane, the pneumothorax can increase in size. Now in general, the risk of a flight related pneumothorax is very low. Uh, these are uh, two large studies looking at emergencies in uh, air travel and there were zero reported cases of pneumothorax. Uh, the there are really no clear guidelines on this question of when can a patient fly after a pneumothorax, um, and the data is really weak, but the current guideline recommendations are that uh, post resolution of pneumothorax, you should wait one week, but after that, it is okay to fly. And in cases of a traumatic pneumothorax, the current recommendation is to wait two weeks. Um, in clinical practice, we usually assess this more on an individual basis, depending upon the risk factors, the reserves, the uh, ability to have a companion, uh, underlying lung disease, etc. So let's uh, move on to uh, something that we experience a lot more in our daily practice. Uh, so I'm going to now focus on some of the rare genetic diseases with a focus on pneumothorax. So uh, this is not a genetic disease, but I want to mention this just be, uh, in terms of raising awareness about this. So there is an entity called the catamenial pneumothorax. So this is a pneumothorax that happens in conjunction with menstruation. Uh, so these symptoms typically develop between one to two days of onset of menstruation. And most of these pneumothoraces, greater than 95% of these uh, tend to be right-sided. And there is a really, really high risk of recurrence uh, to where most patients have had three to five pneumothoraces before they receive the right diagnosis. Uh, this is 
a working hypothesis for uh, how women develop catamenial pneumothorax. So uh, almost well, all of these women have diaphragmatic endometriosis. So during menstrual cycles, uh, the uh, endometriosis on the diaphragm and uh, that tissue also undergoes cyclical necrosis that leads to formation of diaphragmatic defects uh, that allows transphragmatic transdiaphragmatic passage of air and leads to the development of pneumothorax. Uh, the diagnosis really established based on history uh, uh, and subsequent visual visualization of the implants uh, and diaphragmatic defects on VATS. Uh, treatment is multimodal uh, with regards to pneumothorax. Uh, really, that's a mechanical issue. You need to perform VATS and pyrodesis to obliterate the space. Um, now, VATS may help with the pneumothorax weight. That doesn't help these patients with the cyclical chest pain that they still encounter with menstruation. So for that, you really do need to suppress the hypothalamic pituitary axis. In a lot of cases, uh, we typically start with OCPs, but they work uh, less than 50% of the time. So often you have to resort to using GNRH agonists to completely suppress. A um, little bit about familial spontaneous pneumothorax. So even as early as the 1920s, it was noted that when you take a detailed history from patients presenting with what you think is a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, that more than 10% of these patients have a positive family history of pneumothorax. Um, and if you draw these pedigrees carefully, you'll find that this pattern uh, tends to be more of an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern with some sort of a somewhat of variable penetrance. And we now know that familial spontaneous pneumothorax can be seen in a variety of monogenic diseases. So this is a table of uh, the most common of these diseases that we know. And I won't go through all of them. Perhaps the most common ones are alpha-1 antitrypsin and cystic fibrosis. Uh, the most rare are cutis laxa, which uh, causes hereditary emphysema, lois Dietz syndrome, which um, causes a bifid uvula on physical exam. We know about Marfan and Ellis Denlos. Um, and for reference, these are two really good uh, review articles, one by Christine Garcia, the other recent uh, one from Ben Raby and Lisa Hensky, which are, uh, uh, if you're interested for more reading. Um, and for the rest of my talk, I'm gonna focus on these three uh, rare genetic diseases uh, associated with spontaneous pneumothorax. And I'll also go over why I put longer Hans cell histiocytosis as a genetic disease here. Uh, so we'll start with LAM or lymphangioliomyomatosis. So it's a rare systemic neoplasm that arises due to mutations in the tuberous sclerosis complex gene. Uh, this is a disease that almost exclusively affects females, especially females in the reproductive age group. Um, it can occur in one of two forms, one in association with known tuberous sclerosis or in women who don't have tuberous sclerosis, and that's when we call it sporadic LAM. Uh, the central event in the pathogenesis of LAM is that when you have PSC gene mutations, they cause hyperactivated mTOR signaling that drives clonal neoplastic proliferation of smooth muscle-like cells that start somewhere, and we don't know where. We have hypothesis, but no proofs yet and then subsequently invade the lung, uh, causing tissue remodeling. Uh, this is a very simplistic diagram of what happens in LAM. So you have these abnormal neoplastic LAM cells that start, grow um, in likely candidate organs. Uh, they form uh, abnormal lymph vessels, traverse through the lymphatic channels, reach the venous circulation, uh, and through there enter in the lungs. Once they are in the lungs, uh, these cells uh, secrete matrix degrading enzymes um, and also secrete uh, vascular endothelial growth factors, typically VEGFC and VEGFD that leads to formation of lymphatic clefts. And a combination of both of these events leads to uh, cystic destruction of the lung parenchyma. What does LAM look like on a CAT scan? So LAM is the prototypical diffuse cystic lung disease. So 
I've shown two CAT scans. So on the left is a CAT scan of a patient with very mild LAM. Uh, but I like this because it displays the cyst characteristics very nicely. So you have these nice, round, smooth cysts with no internal structure. And the rest of the parenchyma looks pretty normal. Um, and if you have a more advanced case, as in this CT scan, you can see that there is really almost complete destruction of the lung parenchyma. Uh, there are other imaging features that you might encounter in LAM patients that can actually help you with diagnosis. So about 20 to 30 percent of the LAM patients can have chylus effusion. So this is uh, one of the known causes of a chylothorax. And this is one of my clinic patients, and you can see a chylus effusion and the uh, characteristic cysts of LAM. Um, other things that can happen in patients with LAM is that they can develop uh, fatty tumors of the kidneys called angiomyolipoma. So this is one of my TSC uh, LAM patients, and you can see that her entire kidney is replaced by this sort of conglomerate uh, fatty tumor. Uh, incidentally, she also happens to have this uh, in her liver. Uh, we now have a, a blood-based biomarker that can help us uh, diagnose patients with LAM um, uh, and differentiate from their mimics without needing a tissue diagnosis. Uh, this is a biomarker that was developed by Lisa Young and Frank McCormack uh, in Cincinnati. Uh, so this is the biomarker is serum VEGFT. So if you have a serum VEGFT greater than 800, you can see that none of the cystic mimics uh, cross that threshold. So if you have a serum VEGFT more than 800 in women with cystic lung disease, that is almost 100% specific for the diagnosis of LAM. Uh, now remember, there are this is not 100% sensitive. So a normal VEGFT does not rule out LAM. But if you have a VEGFT greater than 800 in cystic lung disease, that is LAM. Uh, and this test is now available um, at Cincinnati in a cap clear approved fashion. Uh, so just a quick recap, these are, if you have a cystic uh, disease on a CAT scan and you have any one of these features, you have a confirmed diagnosis of LAM. So high VEGFT, a patient with TSC, renal angiomyolipoma, chylus effusions, and um, our uh, lymphatic collections called lymphangioliomyomas. And in greater than two thirds of the LAM patients, we can establish this diagnosis without subjecting the patients to an invasive procedure. Uh, we, we had talked about the central event in LAM being an activated mTOR pathway, um, which led to the conduct of this uh, pivotal trial called the MILES trial. So this was a randomized double blind placebo controlled phase three study where Patients with LAM were randomized to sterolimus or, tre uh, or placebo for one year, followed by one year off treatment observation period. So this is the placebo group during the treatment phase with continuing lung function decline. This is the treatment group during that same year showing stabilization of the lung function decline. But during the observation year, off therapy, both groups declined. So this establishes that sirolimus can stabilize lung disease in LAM and is an effective therapy, but it's an effective suppressive therapy. So durable treatment needs long-term drug exposure. Based on these results, sirolimus is now FDA approved for the treatment of LAM in United States um, and in 38 other countries across the world, including the European Union. Sirolimus um, also works very well in helping resolve chylus effusions. This is an image uh, from the uh, an open label study done at the NIH, uh, where you can clearly see that these chylus effusions disappeared uh, after administration of sirolimus. Uh, this is some of the data that we recently published. This is looking at long-term prognosis and development of prognostic biomarkers in LAM, where we have shown that the that's a slowly progressive disease and median survival in women with LAM is more than two decades and this is uh, without rapamycin. Um, and baseline lung function and menopausal status impacts future progression to death or transplant. So if you have a baseline FEV1 greater than 70, baseline diffusion greater than 70 at diagnosis, we have a much better prognosis as compared to impaired lung function and 
premenopausal women have a higher risk of progression to death as compared to postmenopausal women. And these data can now help us create a lamb specific uh, disease severity score that can be used in prognostication and treatment models. That's something we are working on currently. Um, in terms of other biomarkers, we um, this is a post hoc analysis of the MILES data that uh, we, I think, just got accepted for publication. This is serum VEGFT, the diagnostic biomarker we talked about, can also help with prognostication and therapeutic response. So if you look through this carefully, if patients are on placebo and they have a high VEGFT, they have the highest rate of decline. Conversely, if patients have high VEGFT and they get serolimus, they have the, the highest response to treatment. But if you have patients who have low VEGFD, whether they're on placebo or on serolimus, they tend to sort of stay stable around the uh, zero line. Um, now, if you divide this cohort based on menopausal status, premenopausal patients on placebo have the far highest rate of decline. Uh, and postmenopausal patients on placebo decline slower, but both groups respond to treatment with serolimus. In the premenopausal group, the response is stabilization, and postmenopausal women actually had a somewhat slightly increased FEV1 after treatment. Um, anyway, let's come back to the focus on pneumothorax. So, because of the cystic lung disease, um, greater than 50% of lamb patients experience at least one pneumothorax in their lifetime. And if they have one pneumothorax, there's a greater than 70% chance they're going to have at least another one. And pleurodesis can reduce this risk by half. Uh, so uh, we recently wrote clinical guidelines for LAM, and our recommendation is that for women with LAM, pleurodesis be offered following the first episode of pneumothorax rather than waiting for a second episode. Uh, and it's important to know that pleurodesis is not a contraindication to future lung transplant. Let's switch gear to another disease called the we'll talk about pulmonary lung or cell histiocytosis or PLCH, which most of you may know as a smoking related lung disease, uh, which is true because approximately 90% of LPH patients have a current or past history of smoke exposure. This is um, my sort of working hypothesis for what happens in PLCH. So you have peribronchiolar recruitment of dendritic cells. Uh, which causes secondary recruitment of other immune cells, leading to formation of cellular nodules, release of matrix degrading enzymes, causing bronchiolar destruction, which leads to uh, airspace enlargement and cyst formation. Now, why did I mention PLCH in the genetic causes? And this is recent discovery over the past three, four, five years that activating mutations in the MAP kinase pathway are now detected in greater than half of the patients with PLCH. Now for context, these are the same mutations that are seen in patients with multiple myeloma, with papillary thyroid cancers, with hairy cell leukemia. And so this has really put forth PLCH not as an inflammatory cigarette smoking induced lung disease, but really an inflammatory myeloid neoplasm with a working model not dissimilar to LAM. Uh, I won't bore you with uh, bench details, but this is really work by Juan Lu and Michael Borchers. This is uh, the world's first mouse model of PLCH. Uh, so this is uh, a mouse containing BRAF B600E mutation in the dendritic cells. If you give them filtered air, uh, this is relatively normal looking lung parenchyma. They have some inflammation around the bronchioles, really not much. But now if you challenge these mice with uh, cigarette smoke, and you can see just this uh, huge influx of inflammatory cells around the bronchioles uh, and airspace enlargement and cyst formation, this, is, this looks almost exactly like human PLCH. So this is a really powerful model that will help us study this disease uh, in detail and provide novel insights in this. Uh, clinical manifestations, majority of the patients with PLCH have nonspecific symptoms, dyspnea, cough. Uh, 15 to 20 percent of them may have a pneumothorax. A small minority have extrapulmonary symptoms, typically diabetes insipidus or uh, bony involvement with lytic uh, lesions. Um, as compared to LAM, where you had really smooth, round, uniform cysts, the cysts in PLCH are typically described as these bizarre, irregular-shaped cysts. 
Um, and another distinguishing feature is that in contrast to LAM, in PLCH, typically the cysts are in the upper or mid zones and the cost of phrenic angles or the bases of the lungs are typically spared. Uh, if you were to biopsy, this is what you will find. So you have multiple cellular nodules around the bronchioles um, and there is CD1A positive dendritic cells. I put quote in Langerhans cells because these cells are actually not Langerhans cells. So this, this disease name is a misnomer. Langerhans cells are only seen in the lungs. The cells here are really dendritic cells which look like Langerhans cells. Um, and in late uh, stage disease, you can have cystic destruction along with uh, some uh, uh, stellate fibrosis. With regards to therapy, really the cornerstone of treatment in this population is smoking cessation. In the majority of patients, smoking cessation is all you need for stabilization or even regression. Um, important to ask about marijuana. This is something that we tend to forget when marijuana uh, smoke tends to have a similar impact on PLCH as cigarette smoke. <laughs> Uh, we do serial PFT monitoring as a small subset of patients progress despite smoking cessation. That's the subset you want to treat. How to treat these patients is not well established. There are some reports of cladribine. Uh, there is at least one report of targeted therapy with BDAF inhibition, which I think might be the future, uh, but more work needs to be done on that. Um, in the context of pneumothorax, as you can imagine, similarly with a cystic disease, the prevalence of pneumothorax in PLCH is lower than LAM, but once they have pneumothorax, the risk of recurrence is similarly high to the tune of about 60%. And this is uh, some of our data done really by uh, one of our formal fellows, Abhishek Singla, showing that if you manage conservatively, uh, the risk of recurrence is 50% on the first episode, but fluorodesis cuts this risk down to 20%. And if you have a second pneumothorax and you manage conservatively, you're gonna have a third one. Uh, switch gears to the last cystic lung disease I will talk about. This is a disease called Bert Hogg Dubay syndrome. It's an autosomal dominant disorder and it's characterized by fibrofolliculomas, which are hair follicle tumors, uh, kidney tumors of multiple shapes, sizes, and histologies. Uh, and pulmonary cysts. And the central defect here is a mutation in the folliculin gene, which is a tumor suppressor gene. Um, and just uh, some pictures to aid um, in the diagnosis. This is what a fibrofolliculoma can look like. These are dome-shaped papules, typically seen on the face, uh, around the nose, uh, upper torso. Uh, these are very subtle and very easy to miss. These are uh, heavily magnified images. Uh, so when evaluating patients with cystic lung disease or pneumothoraces, pay very close attention to the skin findings. Um, this is um, an image courtesy of the uh, NCI urology group, so a patient with Bert Hogg Dubay, and you can see multiple uh, kidney lesions, uh, and about one fourth to one third of these patients develop kidney tumors. Uh, this is typically a late manifestation, mean age around 50. Um, and the most common cancer is a hybrid oncocytic or chromophobe renal cell cancer. So when we have Bert Hogg Dubay patients, we are actively screening them with renal uh, with MRIs for renal cancer development. Uh, generally, these tumors follow a very indolent course, um, so we do not re interventions are not recommended unless the tumor grows to three centimeters or more in size. Um, and this is a CT scan showing what Bert Hogg Dubay in the lungs can look like. So contrast to, remember, LAM, which is universal, PLCH at the top of the lung, Bert Hogg Dubay produces cysts, which are really seen mostly at the bottom of the lung. Uh, and these cysts can be oval as opposed to, um, say, the round cysts of LAM, and they typically abut the pleura and the pulmonary vessels. Um, the most common presentation from a lung standpoint in Bert Hogg Dubay is spontaneous pneumothorax. Uh, median age is similar to LAM in the mid 30s. There is a wide split here in the literature about the prevalence of pneumothorax in Bert Hogg Dubay, and this is largely due to ascertainment bias. So the 24% prevalence came from Jorge's study that was done primarily on a dermatological, urological cohort. Uh, 
Now, the 76% prevalence comes from our study, which was done primarily from a pulmonary cohort. Both studies have ascertainment bias. The reality probably is somewhere in the middle to where it's about 50%. Uh, but the one thing which is consistent across all reports is that there is a very, very high chance of recurrence, about 75 to 80% risk. Uh, similar diagram as uh, uh, LCH, if you don't do anything after the first episode of a pneumothorax, greater than 60% chance you're going to have another one. And pleurodesis can cut this. Uh, I don't know what happened to these, but uh, pleurodesis can cut this in half. So let's take a pause here. Why am I talking about all these rare esoteric genetic things to a primarily internal medicine audience? So multiple reasons. Number one is they are not as uncommon as you think. So we already talked about the fact that 10 to 12% of patients with what you assume is a primary spontaneous pneumothorax have a positive family history. Uh, these are two studies done, one in China, one in uh, Netherlands, where they studied for follicle in gene mutations, which is the mutation in Berthog Dubé, in patients who presented with what you assumed to be primary spontaneous pneumothorax. And they found that 5 to 10% of the patients with primary spontaneous pneumothorax had underlying birth hog dubey. And so these diseases are not as uncommon as you think. Secondly, something as simple as doing a CAT scan of the chest can help you diagnose and distinguish between these diseases with very high sensitivity and specificity. This was a study we did about four or five years ago where we uh, made a collection of about 100 patients with cystic lung diseases and sent them off to radiologists, pulmonologists with varying degrees of expertise to say, tell us what the diagnosis is without knowing anything about the history. And uh, ER here stands for uh, expert radiologist, but if you just look at expert radiologists, they were able to give us the correct diagnosis in about 80% of the cases without knowing anything else about their history. Uh, thirdly, if you screen for the presence of these cystic diseases in patients who present with a pneumothorax, it is cost effective. Uh, I won't have the time to go into details of this methodology, but this is a decision analytic model uh, using Markov simulation models, where we uh, simulated that a patient comes to the ER with a pneumothorax, and you can e either follow the usual strategy where you don't do a scat CAT scan, or you can follow a strategy where you do a CAT scan uh, and further work up for cystic disease and pleurodesis if someone has a cystic disease. So as you can imagine that the HRCT strategy over a lifetime was more costly than the non-HRCT strategy, but by virtue of getting the right diagnosis and the pleurodesis and prevention of future episode, um, you had an improvement in the overall quality adjusted life years with the cost effectiveness ratio of $1,400 per quality adjusted life year gained. Now, in the context of um, cost effectiveness studies, the societal threshold set forth many decades ago was that if we can gain one quality adjusted life year, by spending $50,000, that is by society considered cost effective. And our cost effectiveness threshold uh, was much below this threshold. Uh, the, so this was a simulated model. Um, I'm not showing you data, but um, on the study by Ashley Catron, we found real world evidence as well that the prevalence of cystic lung diseases in patients with pneumothorax falls within the threshold of the, of the cost effectiveness. Lastly, correct diagnosis changes management uh, many different ways. A, you will consider early pleurodesis. B, in patients with Berthog Dubé, you now have the opportunity to screen other family members, uh, screen for renal tumors. Uh, in patients with LAM, you have targeted therapy on TLCH that will lead to better smoking cessation counseling. And now with the uh, mutational landscape, maybe targeted therapy as well. Uh, so just a, a recap on this, recurrent spontaneous pneumothoraces are common in patients with cystic lung diseases, typically happens between 20 to 40 years of age. Uh, recurrence rate is high and pleurodesis can cut this in half. Um, and spontaneous pneumothorax is often 
the presenting manifestation of these diseases. So think about these diseases when you're in, encountering someone with a pneumothorax. Uh, so now if we take a step back to our case and uh, you have a young, non-smoking, otherwise healthy female who came to you with a pneumothorax, I would argue that uh, this patient should get a chest CT to screen for the presence of underlying cystic lung diseases rather than having the assumption that she had a primary spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, and by the way, data for air travel, this is a work done uh, by us as well as others. Um, we have three different studies have looked at the risk of air travel in patients with Berthog to Bay, and the risk is less than 1% uh, per 100 flights. Uh, three different studies have looked at this in LAM, and the risk is somewhere between 1% to 2%. Uh, and uh, we have looked at this in longer hung cell histiocytosis, and again, the risk is uh, less than 1%. Um, so in summary, just some take-home points for primary spontaneous pneumothorax. Uh, remember, it's common. There is a strong association with smoking. Um, if a patient is stable, observation or supplemental oxygen is okay. Otherwise, uh, think about needle aspiration or a chest tube. A small bore chest tube is equal to a large bore chest tube with regards to management. Uh, you do not need to use suction on routine basis and uh, pleurodesis after the second episode. Uh, about the unusual causes, ask about menstrual history in all women presenting with a pneumothorax. You'll be surprised how often you find uh, thoracic endometriosis. And about 10% of patients with a presumed primary spontaneous pneumothorax have a positive family history. Follicular gene mutations or berthog de Bay syndrome uh, is perhaps the most common of these etiologies. Uh, screening CT for cystic lung diseases in this population is cost effective. If you find a cystic lung disease uh, due to rhodesis after the first episode, it is safe for most patients with cystic lung disease to undertake air travel. And remember that correct diagnosis can lead to a lot of other intangible downstream benefits for these patients. Uh, a quick word, this is a network I'm proud to be of. This is the Rare Lung Disease Clinic Network, uh, where we have about 60 clinics across the world. Uh, dedicated to the care and research of these patients, which allows us um, to conduct a number of studies as well. Um, this is just a rough um, estimate of how many of these rare diseases are being followed in this network. This is a rough guesstimate of what every clinic director thinks at the top of his head. These numbers are not necessarily accurate, but provides uh, at least an idea. Um, and lastly, I, you know, I presented a lot of work for which I have to thank a lot of people uh, for key contributions. Uh, in the interest of time, the two biggest contributions are one, all of the rare lung disease patients. This is really truly a privilege to be able to see them on a daily basis and learn from them and work with them. Um, <clears throat> and lastly, uh, Frank McCormack, who's the division chief at uh, Cincinnati, who has been my mentor throughout, and I don't think any one of the things I presented would have been possible without him. Uh, and these are some of our funding sources for the projects we talked about. Anyway, I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you. That was a great talk, and a really interesting subject. Uh, parenthetically, I've never seen it. And that is, why does supplemental oxygen increase the resource base in the thorax? Yeah, so uh, the, what, what you're essentially... Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the question is, uh, why or how does uh, the administration of supplemental oxygen increase the rate of reabsorption of a pneumothorax? Um, so the theory is that as you give supplemental oxygen, you're causing nitrogen washout in the capillaries. So, um, so the gradient between the pleural space and the capillary space becomes higher, so air can reabsorb faster. Simple diffusion, yes. Simple diffusion, yes.
Yes, this is a question that we get asked every time we see someone with cystic lung disease. The only restriction we offer to patients is scuba diving. Uh, for everything else, we like air travel, et cetera, we say, go ahead. Uh, the scuba diving is also you know, more born out of risk. This is not necessarily something that has been studied systematically. Um, and I've said this often enough, that's the only restriction to where some patient did come up to me with a question that I said, okay, I'll add this to my restrictions. And that was uh, skydiving. Uh, I have uh, no idea, but I, I don't know. I couldn't think of a sane reason why you would want to jump out of an airplane. <laughs> and uh, the only other caveat we tell them is that we teach all the patients uh, what a pneumothorax feels like. And we tell them that if you, before you board an airplane, if you have these symptoms, then don't board an airplane, otherwise it's okay. Yes, ma'am. I'll, my, um, sorry, do, should I repeat every question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the uh, question is, um, is a high risk, uh, is a spontaneous pneumothorax um, a reason that insurance companies will pay for a uh, CAT scan? Um, my, my experience so far, this has not been denied by insurance for a, a pneumothorax evaluation ever uh, that I can remember, but, but uh, beyond that, I don't. A uh, plain CT would probably be okay, you know, and, and you know, there is really a high risk CT is a simple reconstruction of the plain CT uh, anyway. So if someone's okay with the CT, I expect they would be okay with either way uh, one. Oh, no, I'm scared. Okay. We send you home uh, with a Louisville slugger and we would say, uh, Sean Gupta, MD, Medicine Grand Rounds, University of Louisville, March 7, 2019. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much. And that's the picture. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm serious. I have never seen a case of bird loss in bay. Now it's been two months. Two people were bird to And these are for renal tumors? I'm sorry? These are for kidney tumors? Well, they were actually were picked up by dermatologists, and uh, you know, and then they were supposed to be, you know, do something about the kidneys, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, the, I think so far neither one of them has been. Thank you. 